Hello and welcome back to the course Life of Christ. We're now in class 40. This is a two-part class about the story of the Transfiguration. And the more I've studied this story, the more excited I've become about it, and the more I've realized how connected it is with the rest of the Bible. So I invite you to go with me now to Luke chapter 9. We'll take that version of it and read it. And after that, we'll talk about many details of the story from Luke's version and also the other versions of it. Beginning in Luke 9, verse 28. About eight days after Jesus said this, he took Peter, John, and James with him and went up onto a mountain to pray. As he was praying, the appearance of his face changed, and his clothes became as bright as a flash of lightning. Two men, Moses and Elijah, appeared in glorious splendor, talking with Jesus. They spoke about his departure, which he was about to bring to fulfillment at Jerusalem. Peter and his companions were very sleepy, but when they became fully awake, they saw his glory and the two men standing with him. As the men were leaving Jesus, Peter said to him, Master, it is good for us to be here. Let us put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He didn't know what he was saying. While he was speaking, a cloud appeared and covered them, and they were afraid as they entered the cloud. A voice came from the cloud saying, this is my son whom I have chosen. Listen to him. When the voice had spoken, they found that Jesus was alone. The disciples kept this to themselves and did not tell anyone at that time what they had seen. So first of all, let's give some of the background for the story. Um, there are actually two possible locations for this story. Uh, one on this map is up near the north at Mount Hermon. And the other is down here just southwest of the Sea of Galilee at Mount Tabor. And that's actually the more traditional sites of the story. And so let's start with that one and look at the reasons why people think this might be the site. Uh, first of all, we start with a, a shot kind of establishing the geographical context of it. Uh, this is the Jezreel Valley all along here uh, up in, uh, in Galilee, really, to the west of the Sea of Galilee. You see where Nazareth is on the hill, uh, just to the west of Mount Tabor. And then you see this kind of a rounded shape, Mount Tabor, right here. And if you go up a little bit closer, you see it a little bit better from the south. Uh, and then you also see the perspective as if you were standing on the mountain where Nazareth is. And then if you were flying over it, an aerial shot, you see the road leading up to it, kind of a switchback road. And then at the very top, you can barely see a church here on the top, and this is the church that has been built to commemorate uh, this event of the Transfiguration. So if you go inside the church, a pretty simple church again, uh, but the most striking thing about it is uh, this artwork up at the front that shows this story. You see Jesus there in the middle uh, in bright white clothes. Uh, you see Moses over here with the Ten Commandments, and then you see Elijah on this side, and you see the disciples, the three disciples there with Jesus uh, watching the scene. Now, uh, the question is, uh, why do we think this is the site of the transfiguration? First of all, uh, early church fathers, uh, that is uh, some of the earliest church leaders uh, that helped the church uh, remember the important events from the first century. We're talking about uh, in the first several centuries after the church, uh, men like Cyril of Jerusalem, uh, Epiph Epiphanius and Jerome believed that this was the site. And uh, so whenever you have witnesses that are closer to the event in time and also in place than we are, uh, then you tend to pay attention to what they think. Uh, second, you have some details in Matthew 17, verse 1, Matthew's version of the story, uh, that could indicate that this is the place. Uh, first of all, um, it's about a six-day walk from Caesarea Philippi, where we know Jesus and his disciples were in Matthew 16, the confession of faith we just talked about. It's about six days from there down to Mount Tabor. And I've had a guide tell me that uh, he's actually made that walk with a group of students, and they walked uh, in the same kind of schedule that Jesus and his disciples would have done from, from dawn to dusk there, and they they slept along the way, and they said it's actually six days. And so that's one of the reasons he believes that could be. And you see in the story that 
this is mentioned uh, six days in Matthew's version. Uh, now in Luke's version, it says eight days. So there's a little bit of difference uh, between those. Uh, and then uh, there's other details also uh, from Matthew 17. Uh, depending on how you understand the Greek, it either says uh, there was a mountain by itself. In other words, the only mountain in the area. And you saw from the pictures that really Mount Tabor is kind of by itself in the middle of a plain almost. Um, or the other translation could be Jesus took the disciples by themselves. In other words, he kind of separated them from the other apostles, uh, and then he took them up to a high mountain. And so if you understand the first one, a mountain by itself, then it would tend to be Mount Tabor. Uh, but if it was the disciples by themselves, then it could be another location. And then the third thing, uh, well, uh, one more detail on Matthew 17, uh, Mount Tabor is not a particularly high mountain, as it's called in Matthew 17. And so if that's one of the qualifications, it doesn't quite measure up to that specification. Then the third idea here that has to do with whether or not this might have been the site uh, is that back in those days, there was a Roman fortress uh, that was pretty near. It would mean that it wasn't necessarily an isolated site. And so it may not have been as likely that Jesus would have picked this particular site for uh, an event evidently meant to be seen just by a few people. And so uh, although uh, there are some decent arguments uh, for this as the site uh, of the transfiguration, uh, I kind of tend to think perhaps this may not be the strongest candidate for the site. Now, if you continue on and you go back to the map, this time a satellite map, uh, and then you see Mount Hermon up here at the very top of the map, kind of the snow-capped mountains there, um, you get a view. This is what it kind of looks like. It's actually a, a series of peaks, about three different peaks, and the highest of the peaks is called Mount Hermon. Uh, even in the summer, a lot of times there will be snow there. Uh, it's also the only place for skiing in Israel, and you see it's a, kind of an interesting sight here. Some Hasidic Jews <laughs> dressed uh, in their regular clothing but skiing down the mountain, uh, so kind of interesting there as well. And so the question then would come, well, is there any better evidence for Mount Hermon being the site of the transfiguration? Uh, so first of all, you say, well, uh, it's a lot closer to Caesarea Philippi. And so it's possible that after Matthew 16, where they have the confession of Peter, they're at Panius or Banius, um, then they could have just uh, taken some time by themselves. It's toward the end of Jesus' ministry, right before he goes down to Jerusalem for the last week of his life. So it's possible they had kind of a retreat. And then since Mount Hermon was right there, that Jesus walked over with the three disciples uh, and this event took place. And we also know that uh, Caesarea Philippi was a place of worship to Pan and pagan gods. And so Mount Hermon might be a site where Jesus would be pointed, pointed out as the true God as well as he was pointed out at Caesarea Philippi. Uh, then if you talk about Matthew 17 again and the high mountain, uh, Mount Hermon is the highest mountain in Israel. So I think that's a favorable indicator as well. Also, it's an isolated place. It's way to the north, almost to the border of Israel in the north. Uh, and so that would fit well for Jesus to be alone with his disciples uh, as this happened. And then, to me, most interesting in some ways, uh, there are several linguistic and religious history clues that have to do with this site. So let's go, first of all, uh, to the linguistic clues. Uh, the name itself of Mount Hermon appears a number of times in the Bible in different ways. Uh, in Judges 3, 3, um, there is a phrase uh, describing Mount Hermon as uh, Baal, Hermon, B-A-A-L, like the god Baal, uh, Baal Hermon, and that kind of gives the flavor of a pagan god. Uh, also, the word Hermon in Hebrew means sanctuary. It's a, it's a derivation of that word. And so, again, kind of interesting where you have a religious event happening, uh, and the name actually means sanctuary, derived from that word. And then you have uh, another name that's... Um, uh, one of the, the peaks of uh, Mount Hermon 
is named Sion. It's S-I-O-N instead of Z-I-O-N. Uh, but when you hear that, you think of the Z-I-O-N version of it. Uh, that's the name of this mountain in Deuteronomy 4, uh, 48. Uh, and so these linguistic ideas uh, could suggest connections uh, to the religious history of this place uh, and also the future of this place, perhaps in connection to religious things. And then you have another interesting connection with the book of Enoch. Now, um, if you remember some of your earliest Bible history, um, Adam and Eve had a third son named Seth. And according to Jewish tradition, uh, Seth offered his sacrifices to God on Mount Hermon, which is kind of interesting. And uh, according to tradition, it says Lucifer appeared to him and offered him all the power of the world if he would worship Lucifer, but Seth refused Lucifer. And so you think that's an interesting precursor. I think my English teacher would call that foreshadowing there. Um, and it's a picture of what would happen later in the temptations where the Messiah, the last righteous Adam, son of Adam, uh, would conquer all temptation, including that very same temptation to have all the kingdoms of the world if he would just bow down and worship Lucifer. Uh, and so that's part of the setting uh, for early history around this place. And the book of Enoch actually uh, refers to this place. In fact, the book of Enoch is quoted twice in the Bible. Okay. And again, this book uh, of Enoch written by the Enoch in Genesis 5, the Enoch that walked with God and, and never came back, never died, uh, mentioned both in Genesis and Hebrews 11 as kind of a special guy. Well, that Enoch traditionally has been given credit for writing this book. And you have a quote here uh, with a picture of Mount Hermon in the background. And when the sons of men had multiplied in those days, beautiful and comely daughters uh, were born to them. And the watchers, sons of heaven, saw them and desired them. And they said to one another, come, let us choose for ourselves wives from the daughters of men and let us beget for ourselves children. And they descended onto the peak of Mount Hermon. And so if you look um, into Genesis and you look at chapter four, you have a reference to uh, the sons of God and the daughters of men. And then shortly after that, it talks about uh, the Nephilim. And so in the book of Enoch, um, you have a uh, demonic power uh, first entering to the world at Mount Hermon. Um, according to Enoch, uh, there were 200 fallen angels that accompanied Lucifer or Satan, and they made an oath to bind against the living God and destroy mankind. In other words, destroy God's creation. And so they descended to Mount Hermon. Uh, they took the daughters of men for their wives, uh, and they taught them sorcery, dark magic, and incantations. So again, just trying to corrupt the creation of God. And with their union with the daughters of men, they produced a race of giants uh, called Nephilim, which is also mentioned in Genesis 6, 4. Uh, and those, in turn, began to consume all the Earth's resources, including all kinds of wildlife. And then shortly after that, then you find uh, that uh, God is disgusted with the world and what has happened to it. Uh, and so then he decides to destroy uh, the world in a flood and the story of Noah then comes on. And so uh, you see that then in the book of Enoch, uh, Mount Hermon is a place of destruction for those who follow evil, but for those who resist temptation like the sons of Adam, both Seth and Jesus, uh, it will become a place of divine revelation, a place where God will triumph. And so you see that the history of Mount Hermon, the tradition of Mount Hermon, uh, even the linguistic names of Mount Hermon uh, indicated as a place of religious importance, also a place of spiritual conflict. And so all of those things together would make it a really interesting setting for this story of the transfiguration, where Jesus is declared as the Son of God and more important than anyone else. And so I think for those reasons that Mount Hermon is actually a little bit stronger candidate uh, to be the setting of the story of the transfiguration. So that sets up the story itself. We've read the story and some of the background and where and why it might have happened there. And in the next part of the class, then we'll go through 
and pick out different important teachings from the actual story itself. So look forward to seeing you next time. It's going to be good. Thanks.